Okay, hello and good morning everyone. Um, welcome to today's webinar. We've, we've got two presentations today. We've got monitoring ArcGIS services using operations dashboard with Keith Miller from Kapiti Coast District Council and we've also got identifying coastal erosion change rates using DSAS and ESRI plugin with Michael Perry from Jacobs um, and afterwards there'll also be an update from the New Zealand ESRI users group. Once again, I'm Ted Taylor from Eagle Technology, your host again for today, and I'm joined online by Doug Stark from Eagle Technology and, of course, Roland Pomana from the New Zealand ESRI Users Group. So thanks for joining us for, for the seventh session of our user presentations, continuing on with our virtual user conference series from earlier this week. Um, before we dive into the presentations, I'll once again run through the basics for those of you that are new so you know how to get the most from today's event. So as an audience member, you'll be on mute during the webinar, but you will be able to ask questions of our presenters by typing into the discussion panel as shown here. Um, you can send in these questions at any time during today's presentations and we'll address them during the Q&A session at the end. Um, we'll try to answer as many as we can during the time allocation, but if for some reason we can't get to your question, don't worry. Um, we'll pass any unanswered questions onto the presenters at the end of the webinar and they can reach out to you. And if you think of any questions after the webinar, you can drop us a line at gistraining at eagle.co.nz or just feel free to get in touch with the, with the presenters directly. Um, so today's webinar is scheduled to run for an hour in total uh, and the webinar will be recorded so don't worry if you have to jump off at any point. Afterwards you'll receive a follow-up email with the link to access the recording along with the other recordings from the Virtual User Conference series. So I'll now hand over to Keith Miller from, from Kapiti Coast District Council for, the, for our first presentation this morning. Keith. Over to you. Cool. Let's see. Thanks, Ted. Uh, kia ora koutou katoa, everyone. And welcome to my talk about how I put together a, a monitoring dashboard for ArcGIS Enterprise. It's a bit strange doing a presentation virtually, but uh, hopefully I'll, I'll get into this. A bit strange just looking at the screen. But, um, Okay, well, let's see. First of all, a little bit about me. So my name's Keith Miller, and as you can possibly tell, I've got a bit of an accent. I come from Northern Ireland originally, been over in New Zealand about 25 years or so. And I'm GIS manager at Capital Coast District Council, and I've been in the role for about nine months or so. Uh, part, of my, part of my job is managing ArcGIS Enterprise, and so that's why I ended up um, creating this dashboard. Now, before um, I stopped, before I was working uh, with the council, um, I was working at Victoria Victoria University as a GIS developer on a research project for a few years to, using Python. And also about 10 years before, uh, 14 years before that, I was a web developer as well. And I like making tools, which actually make my job and other people's uh, jobs easier to do. Now, I've got a nice professional photograph here, um, which is trying to pretend that life is normal, but reality is this is actually more what life is actually like in lockdown. And I've got my two identical twin daughters and they might pop through and say hello at any point in time. So we'll just see how this see how this goes. I'm sure a few of you are experiencing a bit things a bit like this at the moment. So about the the, the, I had some questions about um, ArcGIS Enterprise. Well, um, I always, uh, it, it's a great system, but I, it can be a little bit of a black hole in terms of how it's actually, what's actually happening in the background. And these are some of the questions that I was asking myself um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Like, are all the services that we've got all, for all the different layers up and running currently? What's the current load on the server? And and you know, how many layers are currently being requested, and which layers are taking, you know, are layers taking a long time to draw, and have any errors or warnings happened recently? Now, it is possible using the tools you can see here, um, the ArcGIS Server Manager, um, to to answer some of these questions in terms of the services up and running. You can pay, you can log into the Server Manager and page through, and actually just see if all of the services up are up. And similarly, for the draw times and errors, you can look in the logs in the server manager. Um, for the load, one of the ways you could actually do do it is to go and log on to the server itself and look at the task manager and see where the, the memory usage is and see if it's going up or down. 
Um, which is so these are all possible, but what I but it's not it's not easy to see, and it's not something you'd be doing on a regular basis. What I wanted was something that would be able to help um, help me find out if if the if if everything's running as it should be, and if it's not, then being able being alerted to it as soon as possible, so that we can actually get in there and fix it. Hopefully, before any users would actually uh, call us up and tell them that tell us that there's a problem. So here's the dashboard. Um, I was ideally wall mounted. That's what we're planning on doing at the council. I haven't quite got there yet. Lockdown got in the way, but um, hopefully when we get back into the office, we'll get this sorted. And what I'll do is I'll talk you through some of the, the different parts of this dashboard here. So it's showing a variety of different figures. So the services requested, this is, um, this is looking in the logs and actually looking to see how many occurrences of you know, a service being requested has happened in the last five minutes. So this whole dashboard is all about what's happened in the last five minutes. Uh, well, the numbers on the left-hand side are anyway. Um, the graphs in the middle are what's happened over, the la over, over time over the last day or so. The layers drawn, that's on the average draw time, but it's actually more indicative of how many layers are actually being requested um, by different users and of what their draw time, average draw time is. Now, over towards the right hand side of the dashboard, you can see um, the top layers drawn, longest average time to draw so, uh, lists. So, actually, tells you which of those, which layers have been most drawn and which ones are taking the longest time to draw. And with the warnings and the errors, this is probably one of the more important ones. Um, current, and whenever I took the snapshot, there were zero errors and zero warnings in the last five minutes. But as you can see on the graph, some had happened in the past day or so, and some warnings about four or five in the morning, and an error about probably about eight thirty, as well. And the columns in the middle, the warnings and the errors columns, um, they show. The, that give the list of that, what the errors actually were. So you can you don't have to go back to the logs to find these. Um, you can actually just view them here and then hopefully take some action based on what you're seeing there. And over on the right hand side is probably the most important um, part of this dashboard is actually how many services are up and running and how many services are down. And so yeah, 94 are the services, the number of services we've got there on the internal our internal GIS system. And if there's any services down, it, it would highlight it here, but not, you wouldn't be looking at the dashboard every, sing, every single minute to see if this changes. So um, what, what I've also done is I've set up an email alert to so the efforts, more than efforts, more than uh, any services that are down, then an email gets sent through um, to me as well. So the technology that I've used, here's the technology that I've used in the, and whenever it's creating the dashboard. Um, it's ArcGIS, actually ArcGIS operations dashboard. Um, this is what you've just seen, and that's the sort of the, the hub for the, the whole thing. Um, but behind the scenes, there's a fair bit of Python going on, and I'll talk through that a bit more in a minute. Um, there's also use of feature classes, um, which are then published into services and layers, and also, Windows, um, some Windows scheduled tasks and batch files and email. So the, those, those are sort of the basics of the technology that's being used here. Uh, how does it all work? So first, I'll just sort of, I'll walk you through how, how it all, I'll, I'll, go through, I'll go through here now. So it, the shed, there's a schedule task, it kicks off, uh, and it runs every five minutes. It's a Windows schedule task. And what it does, it just kicks off a batch file. And that batch file, um, uh, it just starts up a Python script. Python script is effectively the, the middle of this, of, 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 it sort of coordinates it, what's going on with everything here. First thing it does is actually request some, the server logs from the production, ArcGIS enterprise server, our production server. Uh, it just requests um, it just requests the logs for the last five minutes, uh, rather than getting large amount of log files coming through. So the amount of traffic coming back is quite small. It's returned in JSON, and would typically be a few hundred rows for the last five minutes. In our case, maybe up to a thousand or so. 
um, the Python script then processes the logs, effectively aggregates them and pulls out the the pieces the, the pieces of information that we want from the logs, because there's a lot of other information coming through from the logs, but we actually want to know about the services requested, the draw, the draw time and the errors and the warnings. So once we've aggregated all of that data, then we're actually, we need to we write the aggregated data down to feature layers and the, the, down into the, we're actually, the feature layers are actually hosted on our test server. The reason I'm using the test server rather than going back to the production server is so that I'm not actually adding to the load on the production server. And so the way I write the aggregated data down is actually by sending data posting to feature services using the slash add features URL. There's about, I think, eight or nine different feature layers we're actually using for this, and pretty much one for each of the different parts of the dashboard that you've just seen. And then the ArcGIS monitoring dashboard or operations dashboard, it what it's doing is then it's effectively requesting the, the data, the feature layer data, every minute. Um, so that the most so, uh, so if, uh, to keep it up um, up to date as, as much as possible and so that's what's happening there and then as I mentioned before an email is also sent by the Python script if a service is, is down so here's a wee bit more detail about the Python script there's about 600 lines of code and first of all it sends the web request to query the logs it sorts the server logs by time within the five minute period that we've grabbed. Then it filters and aggregates the logs, log messages, posts the time-based data to each feature layer URL in turn, and then sends an email if any services are down. And on the right hand side, you can see a list of the feature classes slash layers that were, or, yeah, feature layers. That, well, these are feature classes in the diagram, but effectively, they are, these are the ones that are actually published to become feature layers um, on our test server. And uh, you've got one, so it's one, two, three, four, five, it's nine of them there. And there's ones for errors, there's warnings that the server status and services down and and layers drawn and so on. So it's basically what you're seeing on the, on the dashboard. Um, what I've done is whenever you, whenever I've published the feature layers, I've actually set those to refresh automatically every minute by putting them into a, a web map and then just going into each of those layers in turn and actually setting the refresh interval for those to be one minute. That's what sends that's what that's what allows the operations dashboard to be able to pull the data through on, on a, every minute. So how do, how do we use the dashboards in the council? Well, we've got, so you've got two dashboards, one for the public GIS system and one for our internal GIS system. Both do the same thing, um, just pointing at different production servers, um, both using the same Python script, um, but they're using different feature classes because they're storing different data and different batch files to kick them off and different scheduled tasks. They're, they're fairly easy to, to set up. So, but at least the, the Python script is is the same between the, the both of uh, between both scripts. So there's no hard coding within within there. Uh, there's a few gotchas. Um, we have to use feature services rather than data tables. I initially tried to just use data tables as um, um, on you know, publishing data tables because even because there's no geographic component to dashboard data, so I thought I, could, I should just be able to use uh, data attribute tables. But unfortunately, that didn't work. Uh, I believe the refresh didn't work correctly. So I ended up going down the line of actually using feature services with no geography component. Uh, the dashboards, I've also found that they time out after 25 or 30 minutes. Now, I think this may well be due to um, our single sign on. Um, I believe anyway, I can't quite, it's a couple of months since it did this, but I believe it's due to the single sign on we've got going. I did find a quick and dirty fix for this, and it's just putting in a, a meta refresh tag into the Arc, into the HTML code for the ArcGIS operations dashboard itself. And so they were, the dashboards were timing out after 20 or 25 or 30 minutes, asking you to re-log in, which obviously is not ideal. But um, what I'm now doing is the refresh, the meta refresh tag 
refreshes the page automatically after every 20 minutes and then we're not asked to log in anymore so you can just leave it open all day and it'll just keep showing the, the information and another thing I found was making sure that to get the feature class definitions right first of all and then adding them to the dashboard and but and not doing it the other way around sort of tweaking the feature class definitions after adding the data to the dashboard because I can I just find it caused problems and I believe it was a refresh problem again didn't didn't work correctly but getting the feature class definitions right and then adding it or if you have to tweak the feature class definitions then you just delete whatever element you've added to the dashboard and then re-add it again that should work and I think that's about it from me um, I've, uh, I've got uh, I'll hand back over to you Ted thanks very much for that Keith um, and just a reminder to everyone out there in the audience if you've got any questions for Keith you can send those through at any time um, during the, the following presentations and, and we'll, we'll address those at the end of the presentation I want to hand over to, to Michael Perry from Jacobs for our for our second presentation. Michael, good morning, and I'll, I'll switch over to you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am Michael from Jacobs Engineering, and I'll be presenting today um, my topic of identifying coastal erosion change rates using DSAS and ESRI plugin. So yeah, just a bit about myself. Um, I am a graduate spatial analyst at Jacobs, started last year. I've got an interest and have mainly been focused on field data collection, design and processing and uh, programming that comes along with it. But uh, start of last year, I did do a pretty cool project which involved uh, calculating coastal erosion change rates. Um, using ArcGIS and the DSAS plugin. So let me explain a bit of how that worked for us. Cool, so just an overview. Um, so the problem is that, as I'm sure we all know, coastlines are eroding worldwide. And this is only going to amplify as the effects of climate change worsen. To put things in perspective, it is anticipated that over a third of the world's beaches will be lost by the end of the century if no action is taken to prevent greenhouse gas emissions. As a result of this, coastal erosion will have a huge global impact on coastal infrastructure. In New Zealand alone, up to $14 billion of council infrastructure alone is at risk, as reported in a local government New Zealand report titled Vulnerable, the quantum of local government infrastructure exposed to sea level rise. Um, obviously, we didn't focus on the whole of New Zealand, but yeah, there was a particular part where we focused on uh, looking at these erosion uh, rates. So the whole purpose of this is that GIS can calculate rate of change statistics of past coastal erosion and will give decision makers a clearer overview of such threats in the future and the ability to enforce the most timely and appropriate measures to mitigate the effects of coastal erosion on not only infrastructure but also our livelihoods. This includes the prediction of future change events based on current and historic trends to better plan future works. So for our methods, um, we used ArcGIS and um, historical aerial imagery of the area of interest was georeferenced and shorelines were digitized. Digitized shorelines were then used as an input to DSAS, uh, which stands for the Digital Shoreline Analysis System, which as I mentioned is a plugin for ArcGIS. DSAS computes rate of change statistics for a time series of shoreline vector data. The outputs generated from this tool include multiple change statistics types of which we chose the most appropriate for our use, giving us vital information regarding the past coastal erosion rates for our area of interest. These past rates are extrapolated forward uh, together with predictions for the shoreline position change due to various scenarios for sea level rise to give coastal erosion hazard zones for designated timeframes, which are then mapped using GIS. So let's have a closer look at that. So yeah, as mentioned, DSA stands for the Digital Shoreline Analysis System, and it's a freely available software application that works with ArcGIS software. 
and it computes rate of change statistics for a time series of shoreline vector data. So yeah, anyone is able to uh, download this and use it. It's free to use and I'll provide a link at the end of this presentation for your reference. This is not just for shorelines though. So even though the nomenclature for the software is based in coastal environment, uh, the application can also be used for computing uh, change of glaciers, riverbanks, or any other land use cover boundaries. So how does it work? Shoreline positions can reference several different features such as the vegetation line, the high water line, the low water line, or the wet dry line. They can be digitized from a variety of sources such as satellite imagery, digital author photos, historical coastal survey maps, which are collected by global positioning system field surveys or extracted from LIDAR surveys. So let me just give a brief overview of the DSA's workflow. So this is a bit different to um, our version of DSA's, which uh, was 4.4. This is the latest version, but um, yeah, so a few additions there, which I didn't make use of when we had to uh, do our task, but yeah, I'll outline them all here. So in step one, uh, you've got the attribute automator. So this is an optional requirement. You can add required fields to the shoreline and baseline layers. Step two is the, um, not an optional requirement. So this is, setting baseline settings, shoreline settings, metadata settings, and log file output options. So for this, we're gonna be using um, a personal geo database as an input containing baseline shorelines and an optional shorelines uncertainty database. Once this has been input, it's time to cast transects. So you can set maximum search distance, transect spacing, and a smoothing distance. Step four allows us to edit transects if uh, needed. This is all done in a uh, toolbar in ArcGIS. Step five is giving us our change statistics. So we can select the statistics we want to calculate. We can specify confidence intervals intersection thresholds, and we can determine rate out display and also create a summary report, which is very useful. And this will give us uh, in our personal GI database, which was an input, our rate transects as a polyline and intersects, which are point uh, data type. And we'll get a summary report in that personal database as a text file. This is an optional step, data visualization, uh, rate display options and clip data to SCE is uh, possible. We didn't make use of that though, as that was a recent addition to the latest version. And also another option here is shoreline forecasting. So you can do 10 or 20 year forecasting and forecast uncertainty. You can choose to do that manually yourself, but um, given the option with TSAS, um, might be easier to do it within the actual plugin. So let's have a look at how that looks um, as an example. So we've got at the top there, we've got our baseline, which is black, and we've got four historic shorelines, red, orange, blue, and green, of representing different years. We can see here that this is a uh, example of what can happen in the real world where shorelines are changing or receding. Um, so the baseline can actually be anywhere. So uh, baseline doesn't mean that is where the shore is. So this probably would be showing a receding shoreline from 1855 to 1997. Uh, we've got a shoreline uncertainty buffer, uh, which the tool will factor in. Measurement distance um, from the baseline to the shoreline is calculated and intersect points, those are the points where the transects and the shorelines intersect. The transects are perpendicular to the baseline, uh, as indicated by the green lines here. And these are used to calculate the change rate statistics. So our approach, 
So what we did is we first had to digitize historical shorelines from historical aerial imagery. So we can use these as an input into the tool. So this um, did cause issues. Uh, we had to georeference the aerial imagery to account for earth movement and we have to determine actual photo dates, which can be hard when some photo dates um, are just within a range. Uh, as mentioned, a previous version of DSAS, DSAS was used. We used DSAS 4.4 to calculate coastal retreat rates and trends. We obtained the total shoreline change from the earliest photo to the latest photo, and results were extrapolated forward and gave val invaluable insight. So let's uh, have a look at what that actually looks like in our application. So it might be a bit hard to see some of the colors here, uh, but we do have represented as a transect, a baseline, an earlier shoreline, and a later shoreline. So our transect is the green perpendicular, perpendicular lines to the black baseline. Uh, the baseline is that black line. The earlier shoreline is the yellow and later shoreline is represented with pink. So you might, uh, might notice a um, few things here. Uh, the, the pink and yellow uh, shorelines do not exactly match up. Um, as you can see, um, there are trees covering where we would like to determine a shoreline. And you, you can't really do much about that. You just have to kind of work with what you've got. But when you when you're able when you are able to see that shoreline, you are able to manually cast transects to transect between the two shorelines that are of interest. So it's a pretty useful feature to be able to manually change the transect intervals, just so you can get the right statistics. But yeah, that is quite a problem there. Uh, so baseline can be anywhere. So here we are. On to in onshore, but it can also be offshore as uh, shown in the previous example. So it doesn't actually matter where it is. And baselines can be smooth. So this one is a little uh, jagged, um, which can affect some results, but there is that option there. And um, baseline can actually be drawn anywhere relative to shoreline data and can even cross among shoreline positions. So just a closer look here without the imagery in the back is kind of what we've got here. And yep, so this is a citation of the tool. So you can go to that link and download the tool and feel free to use the user guide, uh, which is pretty helpful. Uh, it is quite confusing at first and know what to do, so you definitely need that user guide, but it's all there and I've got very good documentation and the tool worked very fine. It is pretty fantastic. So highly recommended if you are doing coastal erosion or shoreline change analysis. Thank you for watching. Um, I'm sure um, Ted will give out our emails, so feel free to contact me um, if you need any more questions or anything else. Cheers. Hand it back over to you, Ted. Awesome. Thanks for that, Michael. Um, for the audience out there, keep those questions coming in, guys. We'll, we'll cover those in the Q&A. Um, I'll, I'll now hand over to Roland from the New Zealand ESRI Users Group for an update. Roland, how are you? Oh, have we got Roland? Hey, thanks, Steve. Sorry, was just muted. I right. uh, was sort of sucked into watching. Hey, thanks, Keith and Michael. Uh, I'm really super excited to be here and be a part of this webinar series. Uh, it's a bit different for the user group. Thank you to everybody who tuned in today and yeah, Ted and Doug for helping us out get through today. Right, I got a quick update. Uh, I see we've got a bit of time up our sleeve, so I might slow down and take my time with it. But most of all, uh, kia ora koutou. Uh, there's quite a few of you online I can see right now, which is really, really cool. And I hope you guys are really enjoying this webinar series. Uh, we would have done this update at the rucks themselves, but uh, as we all know, those got cancelled. But there's a few other things I want to talk about besides rucks and the new virtual conference series today. Um, I'm going to touch on our membership, uh, the upcoming annual general meeting, 
want to talk a bit about the Slack group, the NCDUG Slack group, and also just give everybody an update on some of the stuff the committee's working on right now. Well, we all know the Regional User Conference Series got cancelled, uh, but it's pretty important for us to acknowledge those who were part of that conference series. And just share, I want to share a bit of background behind the RUCS as a series and also where we're sort of headed with RUCS once we get out of lockdown and in the future. Um, RUCS are actually a collaboration between the user group, our events and technology partner, Eagle Technology, and our business partner, GBS and Altera. And without them, we wouldn't have a RUX series. Of course, always we have sponsors with the RUX. Uh, big shout out to these companies, National Map, Geoworks, Jacobs and First Name, who were on board to support the RUX. And unfortunately, you know, we cancelled due to COVID-19. But we're hoping that these guys will all be back with us in 2021 when we relaunch to the RUX series. Now to talk about the virtual user conferences, um, and these things have been fantastic. I've tuned into just about all of them, and it's been really great seeing all the presentations. But I just want to point out, this virtual user conference series would not have been possible without the support of Eagle Technology, uh, not just for providing the platform that we're using today, but also providing the staff and the time to support that platform to let us do this. So we are incredibly grateful. Uh, and Ted, you've been an absolute legend, man. Um, thanks for all the work you've put in here uh, and coordinating these things. You've done a great job. And all those others who've helped in the background, like Doug, Claire, Catherine, Scott, it's been amazing. Uh, thanks to GBS and Altera. They've also done presentations inside the virtual user conference series. And Altera actually invited us all into side, inside their webinar series that they ran and we coordinated to run at the same time as these. So it's been fantastic. But the real stars of this virtual conference series has been the presenters. Uh, thank you to all of you for actually stepping up. I know it's been you and Michael and Keith both touched on it today. It's been a bit different presenting at home, sitting in your house, sort of like talking to yourself and to a screen. So thank you all. Um, although the series isn't over, these people have been amazing to share their stuff with all the rest of us. And lastly, the other people to thank is all of you who have tuned in. Right, uh, I wanna clear up. Maybe there's been misunderstanding up there, out there about New Zealand as a user membership. Uh, so I wanted to take the time today to just clear up any confusion and sort of just let everybody know how we are managing the membership right now. Our membership year runs from the 1st of the July, 1st of July to 30th of June. Uh, so we cross over two years, uh, but the membership year, that was changed last year at the 2019 AGM. And it was actually done to align our membership year with our financial year, because it was making things a bit of a nightmare for our treasurer. Um, there's varying types of membership. So full, light, life, partner. Uh, our business partners have memberships associated with their partnership. And we've got free partners, uh, memberships with student and non-profits. What I will stress is there is no more corporate membership. Uh, there's been a bit of confusion. We've had some emails around people saying that their company is a member of the user group. There hasn't been corporate membership since 2018. Uh, in August 2018, at that AGM, we implemented this structure of membership type, uh, and that was approved way back then. So there's been no corporate membership since 2018. What there is now, though, is an organizational discount. So basically, if you, for every four memberships that you buy, you get a fifth one free. So for larger organizations, we thought that was the best way to help alleviate some of the costs associated. But what I will stress is, and you can quote me on this, you can't buy four light memberships and get one free full membership. The, the discount applies to grouping of similar types of memberships. We'll be sending out a survey very soon uh, to all existing members. Basically, we just want to touch base and see if you want to continue your membership into um, the 2021 membership year. Uh, so that will come out. It won't be a convoluted thing. It'll be short and sharp to the point. Just, hey, I want to maintain it. Or maybe I want to change from a full to a light. Or maybe I want to change from a light to a full. Uh, we'll just get something out to you really, really quick. And the aim is, once we get that feedback, we'll look to be invoicing for 
the 2021 membership year sometime in May to allow you time to pay that before membership actually expires. And the only reason we can do this is because our membership base now, we actually know who you all are. When we did have corporate memberships, we only had uh, a contact email address for basically the account section and we didn't know who you all were. So we can, we're can, we really grateful that now that we know who you all are and we, in fact, we know where you all are. Uh, in our Slack group, we shared a link to a dashboard that was created, which actually shows the membership. And as Scott Samble referred to it, it was a kind of a geek heat map, um, which I thought was a, <laughs> Scott being funny as always. But it does give us a good idea of the spread of the membership, where you all are, and which type of memberships we have. So we'll be sharing that dashboard a bit wider outside the Slack group in the coming months. Right, now, AGM. Uh, I've had a few questions about what's happening with the AGM this year, and there's been a few rumors going around. What I am here to clear up today is the NZEUG AGM will be part of NZEUC 2020, just like it has been forever. Uh, NZEUC is happening, and what I can inform you is that Eagle are very, very close to releasing the details around NZEUC. So we'll still be part of that, and our AGM will still be there like it always is. We'll send out formal notification, uh, probably late July or very early August to members around the exact date and time that the AGM will happen. We'll be asking for nominations for committee members and for life membership before the AGM itself. Now, we won't be accepting nominations for committee or life membership at the AGM. It'll all be done electronically. Uh, we'll do voting electronically to support these nominations and the results will be shared at the AGM. If you've got any questions around it, just get in contact with us. Now, Slack, uh, it's been interesting. We've had the Slack group running for a while now. Most of you are all invited to Slack once your membership's approved or paid or verified. We invite you along to our Slack group. It's very, very quiet in there. Um, but we want to point out, it's it's there for you guys to use. It's there for the membership to have conversations, ask questions, do whatever you want. There's plenty of spaces, there's dedicated channels if you want to be real specific about certain things, whether it's an Arc Pro question or uh, whether it's about Python or whatever. Uh, there's plenty of spaces for you to get in there, just make the most of it. And we've even created a Ask the Committee channel. So if you wanna ask something of the committee, just post it in there and let us know. We've kind of been having a bit of fun with uh, Slack over the holidays and, and using it to run simple polls in there and asking you things like, you know, how's your telecommunications holding up during lockdown? And mostly you're doing really, really well, except for a couple who may be not doing so well. Uh, and polls have been really good for us to just find out what's going on with you guys out there in the real world or at home and what you're up to. Um, really interesting that for those that responded to some of these surveys, it just gives us a bit more insight that, you know, things like COVID-19 lockdown hasn't really made a difference to the way you're working. So again, it's only worth as much as you guys put into it. Uh, it's very quiet in there. There's a few musings in that, but make the most of it. It's a place that you can ask the rest of the membership. There's approximately 400 people in there. So there's a, a reasonable audience if people start paying attention and watching that space. Right, some new stuff. Uh, we've got a refresh of our website being planned. Um, we'll get into that probably once we get out of lockdown and there's a time where we can get the committee back together to focus on stuff and clean things up a little bit. Uh, we're going to do a communications refresh. We had, we have a dedicated communications role within the committee. Unfortunately, that role is vacant right now. So we're looking to fill that or manage that appropriately as a committee. But with an AGM coming up and committee nominations, if comms is your thing uh, or you're a real social media buff, uh, maybe it's time you join the committee and help us out with our communications. And then we're going to try something a little bit different for us. We've never done this before. The committee's been tasked with we need to engage more and have more content to share with all of you. So uh, we are planning something. I will say it's not a podcast. People ask me, it's like, oh, you're going to do a podcast? It's like, no, because I don't like podcasts. But we're doing something and we want to provide a, 
bit of enlightenment, a uh, bit of humor, and a bit more insight into probably what we feel is the most important part of our industry. And other than that, to just top things off, and because and I had the chance to speak to you all, is we want to hear from you. Uh, this committee is here to work for you guys. Uh, our job is to try and do whatever it is you want us to do. But if we just need to get in contact. Just drop us a line. Um, contact us via the website, via email. And there's plenty of other spaces you can find us. Uh, whether you want to follow us on Twitter, on LinkedIn, uh, you can contact directly via the website or email. Or if you're already in Slack, just ask us a question. So all I want to say is uh, from the committee, Thank you everybody for keeping New Zealand safe and staying at home and staying safe. Uh, we hope you're enjoying the web series. Thanks to all our sponsors, partners, presenters, and you guys at home. And that's about it for me. Back to you, Ted. Awesome. Thanks very much, Rowan. Um, and I've got to say, it's, it's definitely been, been my pleasure hosting all these webinars, having all the great presenters on. Um, and yeah, like like you mentioned, we've still got still got one more, so we're not we're not done just yet. Okay, we'll now move into the Q&A part of today's presentation. Um, so I'd now like to call upon my um, my colleague, Doug, to kick us off. Doug, do you have any questions for um, for Keith and Michael? Thanks, Ted. Um, before I do start, I will reiterate uh, what Roland said and um, sort of big congrats in your direction for, for the hosting and the managing of these, uh, these webinars. It's been a challenging time um, outside the workplace, so you, yeah, you've done a superb job, even with five flatmates charging around. Uh, so well done, you mate. Um, to to Keith, um, I also have identical twin daughters, but they're a bit older than yours, so there is light at the end of the tunnel for you, mate. So uh, don't don't stress too much. Good um, to know. And thank you for <laughs> yeah, thanks for <laughs> just as long as that light's not a train. Um, thanks for shedding some light on on the black hole that that is enterprise sometimes and. Yeah, there was a few questions fired fired in. Um, one of them was around uh, a, a pretty simple one. What are the top three reasons for services being down? If if you're willing to share that information, uh, that's a good question, and that's one I've yet to get to the bottom of. To be honest with you, because I've actually just put this dashboard in fairly recently and haven't yet discovered all the. I haven't dug deep yet into all of the reasons as to why things are down yet. So, um, okay. um, yeah, it's mostly I, I've, I haven't actually had many problems with them being down, but occasionally a server might be out or something like that. And then, well, it, I, you know, as this is running on the test server, then if everything's down, then it'll just show a big fat nothing. And that'll just be pretty obvious. But I'll, I guess that pretty obvious, even if you just went to the <laughs> went to our internal GIS system. But um, yeah, I haven't. I, I, in the past, I've had services coming down since actually putting the dashboard in to see, to monitor them. I actually haven't had any real outages to investigate, but so I can't really say too much there, unfortunately. I know, that's that's all good, mate. We might have to get have you back in a, in 12 months' time, and uh, no doubt you'll have a sort of a repository of, of some of that information. Um, just sort of flowing on from that one, uh, is there, you're bearing in mind a, a bunch of the other councils are running enterprise as well, is there any sort of sharing of information and collaboration um, between the, the councils and perhaps, you know, you, once you've uh, got this well and truly bedded in, sharing it with them? I am I'm more than happy to share this, yes, no problems at all. Um, I was just thinking about how the best way to do it, but um, I, will, I will put together something and if anybody wants to... Yeah, probably at the moment email is the best thing just to see how much appetite for this there is and um, yeah but I'm more than happy to share it all um, it'll probably it took it'll probably take about half a day or a day-ish to deploy hopefully um, once it's you know if, if I give some instructions on how to do it it took me about probably a couple of weeks to set up but I would say probably about half a day to a day to deploy um, the dashboards okay no no fantastic just from a from the setup perspective, you, it's it's sitting in test as you said. Yeah. Um, obviously, if test goes down, then you're unable to monitor your production environment. Is there, um, as you say, you've only really recently put the dashboard together. Is there a yep. plan to to productionize the the monitoring um, um, 
and remove it from the, from the test environment? Well, actually, I mean, I put it into test environment initially as it was just under development eff effectively, but I decided to leave it there because um, if I, d I don't want to put any more strain onto the production environment because it would be kind of is that ironic if uh, if if you actually take down production by monitoring it too heavily? It yeah. probably wouldn't probably wouldn't happen. But that's why I've left the dashboard actually on the test server, so it actually um, the feature layers. That's probably I mean the the requests to, um, on the production server. The only sort of thing that we're doing with the production server is grabbing the logs, and that's it as a one-off thing once every five minutes. It's not a big deal. But actually, write, writing to the you know writing to about ten different feature layers um, as well. But that's on the test server, and, and that isn't that much of a, 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 a not, that isn't huge traffic. But at the same time, it's said it, it would be easier just to keep it on the test server and um, just monitor it from there. So that, yeah, just to alleviate or to to relieve, to stop the production getting hammered even more. Yeah, no, understood. Um, Ted, any any questions that that you've picked up? Cool. Yep. I think I think we'll switch across to Michael now. Throw in his way. Um, Michael, here's one from the audience for you. How are shorelines defined? Um, for example, would you be able to to do so, um, not taking high or low tides into account, as you would not know that from the aerial photos? Um, I think the key is just being consistent. So, um, yeah, whatever you want to use to define the shoreline then that is best, but just yeah, be consistent with it. Um, it can be hard to determine. I had a few issues when I was determining the shorelines. Um, I think there were two paths sometimes, but um, yeah, get guidance too uh, from a coastal scientist. So yeah, yeah. that's a good idea. Um, it, another one on that note um, around the um, recognizing where the shorelines are, is, is the shoreline identified by visual recognition within the plugin from from say like an algorithm of some kind is that offered uh not in the version i was using 4.4 .4. i don't think so in version 5 um the latest one be cool if it did and who knows it could but uh not when i was using it so it was all by hand so it was just a yeah, pretty manual process just you know going up and down the shoreline um getting to the points yeah it was <laughs> It'd be cool if that that could be something in the future, and who knows, there might be some other software that can actually do that. But no, I did it all by hand. Yeah, yeah. Um, was was there any? You mentioned that user guide um, that for reference, um, and that yeah. could sometimes be a bit challenging. Did you have any other resources, say, from from other um, organisations, companies in New Zealand that are using this plugin as well that you could get in contact with, or was it all something you just had to tackle, um, tackle by um, yourself? Yeah, no, we had another guy uh, that had already done this um, at Jacobs. So I did ask him a few questions and I definitely needed to. Uh, some things in the user guide were quite hard to understand too. Um, so yeah, I did use him, but no one else. I think, yeah, best bet is user guide really. Look at it, try to read it. Um, there are some videos online. I think I used some you know, videos on YouTube and stuff for that. Uh, there might be some, yeah, other sources, but yeah, no, can't recommend, uh, can't suggest anyone else. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose the, the web's web's a great resource. If you can if you can dig, you should be able to find um, find some things that will help. Um, yeah. I've, I've got, an, got another question for you here, um, Keith. Have you considered using using FME in place of a Python script to achieve the same thing, or or is there a reason that you that you chose Python over over FME? Um. To be honest, I haven't. I have. Um, I've only recently heard of FME, and I know it. I can do automation and so on, and I definitely want to look into it. But um, I didn't because I don't know it, and I guess I've just I've been a Python developer for about four years as well. So it was the first thing that came to mind was just to use Python. But I believe you could you could use FME to do the same thing as as far as I'm aware. But no, there's no reason why I didn't use Python. Definitely makes sense to, to use the system that you're most familiar with and best best equipped to do so. Yeah, that, that was pretty much it, yeah. Yep. Um, Doug, do you have any other, other questions you'd like to ask? Uh, I haven't actually, Ted. Um, not even any of my own. So um, 
yeah, I think that might, uh, unless anybody else has got any questions they can quickly drop in, um, that might bring us to a, to a close. Obviously, Roland, is, we have no questions for Roland. His presentation was so succinct and clear. Um, so yeah, we'll wait another minute or so if, if you guys have any more um, any, any more questions to send in. Keith, I've actually got one more um, one more question for you. Are, are there any other additions that you're planning to add into that dashboard? Say, say with the new with the new versions of dashboards coming out, are there any things you're looking to looking to incorporate at some point in the future? Um, I haven't got anything in mind, but I'm definitely interested to see how the new dash, the version of dashboard what it looks like when it comes out, and I'd probably switch over to it. Um, yeah, nothing comes off it. Not nothing off the top of my head, I'm afraid. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's that's all the questions for today. So, so we'll wrap up there. Um, um, yeah. If, if there's anything else you guys think of afterwards, please feel free to contact us at, at geoastraining.co.nz, or you can you can contact um, the presenters directly. Um, we do have one final virtual user conference webinar which is taking place next week on Tuesday the 5th of May at 11 a.m. so please please visit the Eagle website here and register if you haven't already done so um, and if you've missed any of today's recording or you wish to check out any of the others from the series you can jump on that, that go to stage link there and check out the other recordings and, and, and again a massive thanks to, to Keith, Michael and Roland for presenting today and, and putting all that information out there and thanks thanks to all you guys for joining us um, we look forward to having you having you back again once more next week for the conclusion of the series and 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 um, hopefully connect with you face to face as soon as possible. Cheers. Thanks, everyone.